I'm going to kick off with the clip just to sort of get us rolling. Um, interestingly, this, this clip uh, is, is from a series called The Last Peasants. And I think what's interesting about The Last Peasants was uh, the relationship I built up with the director, which we can talk about more afterwards. But the, the way it was shot was kind of interesting for me because what we tended to do was we would um, we, we would suggest conversations to the people that we were working with. The, the, the whole series was shot, well, not the whole series, the, the bulk of the series was shot up in, in Romania, the very northern tip of Romania where it borders Ukraine. There's a small <coughs> village there called um, Budest, which was at the time we were filming and at the end of the 90s was going through a transition because of the economic migration. All the young people were leaving um, Romania, not just this village. They were all leaving because they, they, were, they were illegally um, getting uh, jobs abroad and they, they didn't have passports. They were all getting out of the country through various ways. Some of them were sort of hanging onto the bottom of trains you know, or hiding in trucks with lots of other people. So it was, it was quite desperate what they were trying to do. And they were all getting out of the country basically to earn money. Um, the village that we were in, for, we were there for around 14 months on and off. They didn't really deal with money. They, they were sort of, mm. everything was bartering. So if you had the threshing machine, you'd thresh the corn at the harvest and you'd get a cut of the corn and you know, you'd have the skills that you would trade. No one really had money, so, which was a, a problem if, if, for example, you know, your cow died, you wouldn't be able to afford to buy a new one. So it was, it was quite, it was quite tough. Um, I think the influence, uh, w before we started the film, the only thing that, we re that I remember doing was reading The Woodlanders by Thomas Hardy. That was, uh, the director was Angus McQueen and he said to me, read this book. And that's what I had in my mind when I went to this small village. So I'm going to show you um, clip number one. După Revoluție am zis să putem să muncim și la noi și să facem ceva să fie bine. Cum să câștigăm în Occident și noi putem să câștigăm în țară la noi. Deci o merita și chiar dacă n-aș câștiga nimic, eu îți mândru că am realizat ceva cu tatăl meu. For two years, Radu has worked for his father building a new sawmill at a time when many of his friends have deserted Budesht and gone abroad to work illegally. For generations, the Bud family has been at the heart of the village. They have sawn the wood that builds the houses, the bridges, and even the church. Now his father is determined that Radu should marry. Lucruri să aibă fata, trei lucruri. Să fie frumoasă la chip, așa, din oameni de ominie și să o casă nu se bolnavă. Pe mine nu mă interesează de căcum e. Nu m-a găsit un surat. Fată de la oraș, aici nu zine pântina asta. E o tărancă proastă ca și noi, altfel nu faci nimic. Te lasă și se duce. Te gândea bine acum, să nu ne faci de rușine.
Just down the village street, the Marinka family farm a couple of acres of potato fields. The son, Vasile, is facing the spring ploughing without his wife, Mihaila. She is working illegally in Paris, and so his parents will have to help him in the fields. Mihaila works as a cleaner. She traveled to Paris on a tourist visa she bought for 900 pounds. She borrowed the money from her sister and brother-in-law, who are also working here illegally. Having made enough money, they are about to return to the village, leaving Mihaila on her own. So that was a series of uh, three films. Uh, we'll sit here, actually. So, and, um, if you can't hear me at the back, just shout. Um, and it was a great experience for me because we got so close to those people, those families, uh, during the process. As you can imagine, we, we were living in the village with them. We had our own house, actually. It was, it was a new build in the middle of this house. Everything else was wood. And we had the brand new house that was made of, of, of brick. Um, and, and just the, the way it was shot, I mean, I think it's quite important. It, it, uh, it was shot on Super 16. Uh, I was all shooting on an art on when I shot Super 16. And um, <coughs> what we did was we pre-lit the houses. The conversation you saw with the young guy um, in the kitchen with his parents was an example of all the main characters. I would. When we came for any length of time, I'd go into their houses and I'd pre-light them all. So I'd put lights up in the ceiling on clamps and bits and pieces. So that whenever we walked in, we had one switch that would just click and it would be lit. And that, that allowed us to sort of uh, start the process of filming people without going to, you know, all the palaver of putting up lights and stuff. You know, if we needed it, sometimes the light was beautiful, sometimes it was dark. A lot of the time it was dark in those houses. Um, and the way we did it was, as I said at the beginning, is, is quite interesting, is 
there were certain topics we wanted them to discuss for us, and we would suggest conversations. And, and they were brilliant, they just did it, and it wasn't a problem. And interestingly, it was, it was very um, uh, concise. It didn't actually take very long for them to talk about what we wanted them to talk about. So, especially on film, where it's expensive, we'd get it quite quickly, and then we'd move on. And we used to spend a lot of time hanging around, thinking about where we were going with the film, and thinking about what characters were where and what was happening, and looking at life in the village. And to the actual filming, we didn't do that much of it, to be honest. You know, it was, it was very um, precise, like the, the scene in the, in the sawmill. Again, probably there for an hour or two, and then we'd go back to our house and chat about where we were going with other scenes. Um, the way, obviously, um, I don't speak Romanian, so the way we did it was that the, the producer was also a Romanian uh, woman who spoke Romanian, and she would be constantly with me, speaking in my ear, just whispering in my ear, telling me what was going on. And so if the conversation was going in the right direction or not, then she would be basically trans loosely translating what they were talking about. And if I felt it was going off the track, I'd sort of cut and we'd regroup and they'd have a chat. I'd have a chat with Angus, the director, and then we'd maybe start talking about why it's going off track and where we wanted it to go. And that's kind of, so there was a sort of fair amount of intervention, if you like. Um, and I don't know how you all feel about that, because there is this sort of interesting, um, you know, when you talk about what documentary really is, should you be intervening? I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. You can't not. <laughs> you know, you're there already. So I, I, I agree, yeah. Really, so. You can't not, yeah. No the fact that you're there at all. Yeah. Uh, but it's to, it's to what level you think you can intervene. Um, which I think, personally, is sort of important because, um, you know, you are, at the end of the day, making a film. And, and I think, you know, I think uh, what happens a lot today, I see, is people just, uh, they have their characters, they have a subject, they have a situation or something going on, and they just just film kind of what they see, and which is, if something extraordinary is happen, happening, then that's all you really need to do. But if, if it's not extraordinary, you kind of need to guide it a little bit. And I think a lot of people uh, are guilty of just waiting for something to happen. You know, they're, they're sort of standing there with the camera and filming, 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 and thinking, well, something's good going to happen. Yeah, it must happen soon. And, and I, I think that's a fairly lazy way of making films. And I think that's why it's important to get more involved. I don't know, does it, would anyone agree with that? Mm. I was just wondering, if you were to set up the lights inside the house mm. and just light the house maybe stylistically, would you say that would be kind of intervening? Yeah, I think in this situation it wasn't really an issue because uh, when I say light it, it was very basic because mm. obviously we didn't have a lot of lights. So, for example, it got as basic as putting black wrap around single bulbs in the middle of rooms so that the light would fall off from the walls, mm. that people would move around and they would generally be lit and sometimes they would move out of the light. Mm. Uh, or you'd put a light over a, um, a, a stove because you knew mum was always cooking. So key areas like the tables, you know, you, you'd make sure you, if someone was sitting there, because they generally all sat in the same place, but it was just getting, a, uh, getting some light to shoot with. There wasn't, there wasn't really... The way I light is I generally is to try and keep things very natural looking. Uh, not always the case, but that's, that's how I wanted to look. So it's, it's actually very basic lighting. But it meant that we weren't in a dark hole. Mm -hmm. Some was... One of the scenes where the guy was talking about his girlfriend and the gossip that was going on. How did you go about that, you know, to actually decide on what they were going to talk about? Because that, that's like a sensitive, kind of quite a sensitive well, issue, maybe, for... Well, we, we, knew, we knew that um, Dad wanted his son to get, get, to get a wife because we, we were hanging out with them and that's what they were talking about. We knew, I mean, that was real, I mean, that wasn't made up, and, and he was, you know, he, that, that uh, young guy in the lumber yard was actually getting quite old to still be a bachelor, so his dad was desperate for him to get a wife. So uh, I think as far as talking about sensitive subjects, there's a lot of sensitive subjects in the film, and like a lot of films I've worked on, and again, it's, it's down to uh, them trusting us. 
you know, we, we weren't going to, it wasn't going to be exploitative or sensational, sensationalized. It was, uh, it was something that they felt very strongly about. And, and was, you know, certainly for the, the father and son in that scene, for example, um, it was real. I was just wondering where do you draw the line of maybe pushing them in the, that direction? And well, when, we, when I say we guided the conversations, it was, it was very general. When he started talking about the villagers saying that she might be seeing somebody else while she's away, I mean, we, that, that just came out naturally. That, was, that wasn't anything to do with us. I mean, when I say guiding the conversation, generally it was giving them rough topics. But they were very broad. And so the conversations that happened were real. Because otherwise, I mean, you don't start giving them scripts. You know. How long did he spend living in the village then, or did he go back once or several times? We did about, uh, I reckon we did about 10 trips over 14 months. Uh, the longest was probably about two weeks, and the shortest was one day. I went back, I went back at the very end for one day just to film. At the very, uh, just at the end of the editing, we, re we learned that they were building a road through the village. So I went back to film the road being built, just for one day. I mean, it was a nightmare to get to. Uh, I mean, it was a long trip. You had to fly to um, Bucharest, and then it's a 12-hour overnight train, and then it was a two-hour drive up through the mountains. So it was a long way to go. So you really became part of that community then, by you know, oh yeah, no, we we we're still um, we're still in touch, and um, the producers. She lives in Southampton now, but she's always keeping us informed of what's going on. I mean, the, the chap that you saw, um, I don't know, I'll spoil anything, but he did get married. We filmed the wedding. And um, but they're now divorced, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel a sense of responsibility for the people that you film, you know, so that you are revealing the fact that they're doing something illegal? There is a sense that you are sort of exposing them to some kind of risk. Yeah, there was. I mean, the hardest part was when we were filming them on the on the journeys out. Um, it was um, uh, it was a very difficult decision to make. With uh, one of the characters uh, was on a train, and I. They got to Austria and they were going to Germany and they got caught. And we weren't with them, we were passengers on the train mm -hmm. and they were on their own and we saw them getting caught and we thought, do we intervene? And we didn't. And of course we really wanted this person to get out, but they were arrested. We saw them arrested and then they were taken back and then we went back to the village and we filmed him coming home to a very disappointed wife. So we weren't intervening uh, to that level. We were actually following what was really happening. So you didn't feel at any point that your responsibility would have involved? Do you think an intervention would have made a difference? But we could have easily driven him out of the country in a hire okay. car. Yeah, but that's not what that's it's not about. Story, no. no. I mean, intervention, it's a very tricky, yeah. tricky subject, actually. Um, so did you film the arrest, or could you? Yeah, we, we, yeah. We, we, he was filmed having his ticket checked and his, the documents checked. But, I mean, it was a long process, the filmmaking. So two years later, uh, it, they could have been anywhere, to be honest. And most of them wanted to go back. Mm. They're all they're all saving money to go home. They didn't mm. want to stay in Dublin or Paris or London, wherever they ended up. Why do you think people participate in being in a film like that? Do you, do they feel that you're going to? Something for them. I, I think in that situation, um, I think they were genu genuinely moved that someone, these complete strangers from Nowheresville, landed on their planet and actually genuinely wanted to listen to them. I think that's what happens with all people in, in any subject in the documentary is, is people really like being listened to. And I think that's, you know, we, a good documentary maker is someone that can listen to somebody and care about them, actually. You've got to care about your subjects. You know, um, they might not be the kind of character that you would like in, in everyday life, but um, everyone's a human, you know, they're all human beings at the end of the day. And you, to see that side of somebody is, is, is really important. Yes? It's more of a, a technical question about the shot where you're coming down the, back of the stairs with the yes. girl at Paris. Yeah. Did you rehearse that, or was that constructed, or was that just she happened to be on the phone, she's heading out, and you followed her? Um, the shot downstairs wasn't rehearsed. Um, generally don't rehearse anything. I prefer not to rehearse anything. I knew the stairs were there, and of course we'd be going up and down them a lot anyway. 
Um, normally, I, I, I try not to film anyone from behind. I always like to be there with them. I mean, like the telephone conversation, it actually started quite profilely. I mean, it started at the back and then got quite profilely and then ended up being in front of her. Generally, I'd always try and be in front of somebody and be walking backwards. Um, but obviously, the reason of following her downstairs was to see the environment, which was very um, grim, to put it mildly. I mean, she was living in a, a, a demolished warehouse in a room on her own and downstairs were 50 Romanian men in caravans um, downstairs, so it was pretty grim. And it was, you know, there was no running water, there was no sanitation or anything like that. Um, I'd quite like to show you just a little bit more of her because, um, and I would also like to get to what you were talking about earlier as well, but um, I just want to f finish off that little story with this uh, idea that, that, that I think is, is, is very prevalent today in, in that you can't really get intimate with somebody in the, you know, unless you've got a little camera and you're there on your own. And, and most of the films that I've made have generally been with full crews. So that, that woman, Mihaila, uh, Mihaila, you know, there was, there was uh, apart from m me on the camera, there was a sound recorder to the boom, there was a, an assistant uh, camera who was loading the film, there was a director, Angus, there was the producer, Claudia. Uh, so there were five people generally hanging around with that person. And and it was all about winning their trust and building a relationship with somebody and that's what allowed us for them to tell us you know their stories and and, and open up their hearts to us really um, so i just want to show you another little bit clip, clip two Bani ăștia ca și dracu. Chiar dacă am venit aici, într-adevăr am nevoie de bani, chiar dacă mă ruga Vasile, zice să nu rămâi singură, dacă vrei, nu sunat, întoarci de acasă, oricum, zice, de foame nu o să muri. N-am văzut că aici se câștigă bine. Un an, un sacrificiu. Aici am... Pe majoritatea care stau îi cunosc, deci nu am de ce să-mi fie frică, chiar dacă beau sau nu știu ce, nu îndrăznesc să intre niciunul la mine în cameră. Nu avem ce să facem, sperăm că facem bani și ne întoarcem la familie și la toate. N-am venit pentru totdeauna să rămân în Paris. Așa că un an o să treacă cumva și să-mi cumpăr și eu o casă și să pot să stau liniștită. Ce să fac? Să plâng tot timpul gând o casă? It's just interesting just watching it. Um, sort of how it's constructed and I think it's like a, there's nearly a minute and a half of images before we see her talking in sync um, and how much attention to detail there is for the images setting her up as a character cleaning and then all the things around her and also I, I knew we were going for a big interview that that day it was end of day it was getting dark I was worried about losing the light and that's you know why I'm sitting in very close to that window and, and, and I was even though I knew it was going to be a very 
powerful interview, it, it still had to look good. I think there's nothing worse than um, having something like that where it's, where it's all just a bit fuzzy and, and you've got distracting backgrounds and things like that. Um, but that was after a long time with Myla, um, spending time with her. And I think, you know, you can get close to people with, lots, with a full crew. I think it's really important to not be worried about having a sound recorder or having someone to help you carry the tripod or whatever. I think the important thing is, is to um, work hard at building up your trust and relationships with, with these people. I mean, did anyone think that was, uh, it's quite interesting sometimes um, I've had uh, people in the past that talk about getting sort of too intimate or, or too, you know, um, in, in, in somebody's face, too obtrusive. No one, no one felt that today? Good, good. It's so beautifully shot. It sort, of, it sort of protects her, doesn't it, in a way? It was protected. And actually, we were her friends. I mean, how you feel and, and some, sometimes people really want to talk, don't they? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm assuming that you've done a lot of um, fiction work as well. I have, yeah. So, and I just wondered how much you feel that sometimes that affects the way you shoot something for a documentary. Um, not so much the actual shooting fiction, because it depends on the style of the fiction, but... but that sense of control that you have. Yes. And wanting it... But my, my influences are definitely from... I mean, my main influences are from films, really. Yeah. But, I mean, things like... Uh, I was saying earlier about other influences, like... Um, literature or painting. I mean, painting. I used to love Rembrandt. Mm. So for me, to get someone with really nice, strong light, very high contrast, you know, I love it. It really, it really excites me getting that look mm. and, and, and having the, 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 the control, if you like, to say, well, let's sit them here and let's put them there and let's put that light up there and that's how I want it to look. And then, then you start talking. And then, and then all that's forgotten. It's also interesting how you can do sometimes very sophisticated lighting setups where there's just bombarded with lights, but you can still go in with a very, very intimate conversation, and they will forget it. They will always forget it. They have no idea. Um, I, I have asked people in the past who've never been filmed before, and they're surrounded by lights and loads of people, and they say something really uh, very honest and from their hearts, and, and you say, did it bother you all the lights? And they say, what lights? It's really interesting. I, 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 any more questions on, any more thoughts on... So who was it that she's speaking to in the interview? Uh, she's speaking to Claudia, the translator. She's, she, 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 the producer, she was also translating. So all the interviews uh, were done through Claudia. So they, were, they were done with Claudia during the interviews, or was it always question, translation? We'd have a conversation before the interview started with uh, what questions we were going to ask and also what, you know, what, what we expected and wanted from those questions. And, and then we'd do, I don't know, three, four, five questions. If Claudia felt that she wanted to follow a path, then she would. Uh, or we would stop and we'd have a little chat to talk about what's been said, because obviously we don't go too far without know what, know, know what's going, being said. Um, have a little catch up, I mean, that's on film, so you're stopping every 10 minutes anyway. Right. Um, that's a good time to have a little catch up. But having said that, you know, you might have an answer the last five minutes. You might get two questions a roll. Uh, and, and, then, and then that's how we did it. So there's always conversations going on between mainly Claudia and Angus, but also with me, you know. Because obviously when you're looking through a camera, you feel a lot. You should feel a lot when you watch their body language. And sometimes you think, I really want to know this just by looking at what their face is saying. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you just use the, the role changes as an excuse to bring the director up to speed? Um, I suppose in that case, but, but nowadays obviously that isn't uh, an issue. Uh, but a good director will just stop when they want to pause anyway. Uh, I think, again, you know, people shouldn't be afraid to stop. Unless something's really flowing and you really want to get it, then that's fine. But if you just want to think, which I think is really important, then you just stop the camera and do that. You don't need to keep filming. Um, I'm going to sh show another little clip, which is from a, a, another foreign language film in, uh, shot in Japan about the world. It was geisha, called Geisha. It was about the world of geisha, um, and it, again, it was. It, but it, I just want to show it because it's a very different style to this, uh, and and the director uh, Joanna Bailey 
is very visual, very good visually, and it was fantastic to work with her because we really tried to make the most out of the, well, the locations were interesting. We were it was all filmed in Kyoto, and we had these uh, four main geisha characters. Two were very young, they're called Maiko, the trainee geishas. So there two young ones uh, and two, two experienced ones, and then we had two main uh, uh, customers who were very, very, very difficult to get uh, on camera because they don't want to talk about it. And no one wanted to talk about geisha at all, and it took months and months of negotiations to actually get in to this world. And when I got there, having spoke to Joanna about it, what I realised there's all these lovely, there's lots of screens, rice paper screens everywhere uh, in their houses. So it was fantastic for me because I could put lights behind them and uh, you know really work with these lovely spaces that they had. But what, what, what I really want you to notice is um, looking at the, the, the colours and the tones that go through. This is just a, a, a chunk, it's a, sort of a six minute chunk. And just looking at when things are warm and which, when they're cool. And we had, it starts off with a young uh, trainee geisha that, um, and she's just so young and just so vulnerable and we sort of felt really we wanted to protect her. And we, we, whenever we filmed her, she's always in these warm environments and sort of cocooned. And I think that it starts off with she's in her bedroom chatting on the phone to a friend and gave her the space to do it, but also made it feel like she was closed into this, 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 this warm environment. And then I think uh, there's a shot, we go out on the streets and there's a, if you don't notice it, there's a, there's a panoramic grade, which is quite interesting because it goes from the warm of this, warm, this, this young woman's house to the, the coolness of the streets. And it's, and it's a very obvious panoramic grade, which is quite nice, going from warm to cool, and then we're around on the streets. And then I think there's uh, the first guy we interview that's interviewed in it. He's a very bubbly, jolly character, and we decided to go, and he was sort of full of life, and so we put him in the surroundings, as a bar, and he was, uh, again, it was quite warm and intimate. And then, and then the second guy was very cold and, and uh, very uh, difficult to talk to. So we kind of shot him slightly differently, and it made it look um, cool and remote. Uh, so anyway, all these little influences were going on as we were shooting it. Um, so I'm just going to show you. あんまり長くは無理やね。うん、長くても3泊ぐらいやと思うねんけど。うん。うん。で、多分ももちゃんとね、一緒に帰ると思うしね。うん。このももちゃんの後にホームステイほら。うん、なんか帰るっていうかうん。もうすぐ帰れるけどね。と、うん、10月はするよ。えっとね、うん。うん。<笑> から
ですよ、ね、まあまだ全然分からへんのですまだいかんとそういうのは全然分からへんもしもねあんまり好かへんようなお客さんだった場合は、うん、どういうふうに対処してるまたそういうふうに思ったらもうものすごい嫌になってくるしまたその人に合わしたうんこうおしゃべりみたいなことをして、うん、あんまりこう気に入らないってことは出さんように、うん、してるんですお子さんとかまいかさんはまあ男性尽くすというねタイプですね、うん、で我々のうちらの女房はもう全然尽くしてくれませんから最近は<笑>いろいろ女房を助けていろんなことやってますけどまああの端一つねあのさあ何でも旦那さんの方のねもう親昔の男のスタイルでズボンはまあね脱がしてくれる畳んでくれるねもう背中流してくれるとそう,そういうすべてがありますねそういうことをやってくれるマナーがありましたけどもうそういうのは女房はしませんね今は<笑>全然ねそういうことはね奥様はあの旦那様が祇園に行かれることを心配なさったりとかなさいませんか女である以上心配しない女性はないと思いますこれは商売人のやはり女房として割り切ってもらわんといかんとこちらが想像します。まあ私の家内は比較的ボーリングが上手でしてね。かなりボーリングに私が業町に行ってたときには。言ってたようですだからプロもよく知ってますそのくらい上手ですはい私はやっぱりこうちょっと一枚壁を置いてしまうというかいちいちお客様にね「あの結婚したはのどすか?」ってうちらが聞くわけでもないしそういうことを別にあの聞くようなあのとこでもおへんしねでもう別に一応こうお仕事と割り切ってますしそんなに変やとは思ったことおへんね。ねで男はまだ遊んでない男はやぶくさいんだと、まあ、あまり女房には遊んでる話はしませんから<笑>今日もお付き合いで疲れたいっていつも帰ってきてますけど<笑>うんあまりこ,こっちが辛いこと話はしてもいいことした話はしないですね全然<笑>。There's a definite、uh, mood running through that film, and I don't know whether things are the, the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but generally, the, 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 the colder personalities are given the sort of cold treatment with the camera as well, and the, and the, the warmer ones were allowed that, that warmth in their life.、And、I think it added a lot to、uh, 
I mean, the mood of the whole film is a 60 minute documentary, so. Um, but yeah, I just, it, it's interesting. I, I, I realised the taxi, um, just watching it again, um, you know, it, it's actuality. And again, it was a similar thing. We knew there was a few questions we wanted to ask in the car. There weren't many. And we, we knew once we'd got them, it allowed me to concentrate on all those <coughs> images that, that put the whole thing together. I mean, it's, it's the same with the interview with the woman at the end. Uh, the, she was a very top geisha, very, very difficult to get hold of. It was a very, very stressful morning. We only had it for two hours. We wanted to do that whole dance. There's a, there's a big dance thing, which you saw a part of, which we had set up on the big dolly with tracks, and we had the HMIs, the big lighting set up. We pre-lit the interview for her because time is so precious. So she did her dance, and then she sat down, and she did her interview, and, that, and then she walked away at exactly whatever it was, 12 o'clock. Uh, and again, what was important making the film was always trying to capture images. All those uh, geishas on the streets was really important. The rain, the, 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 a lot of shooting in the evening to capture that, that Kyoto just coming alive at night. Um, and, uh, the, the, the close-up details that we did of the actual makeup and the dress and the faces and everything. Um, any thoughts on that? Uh? Just a quick question. Sure. Um, obviously, your your subjects um, they know that you're filming them. You've discussed it with them, etc. But I'm, I was interested in when there's extras who, um, and I'm thinking of when she went in the taxi. Yeah. The taxi driver kind of glanced round, and I wonder if. He might have been surprised to see a, a cameraman or a film crew or whatever, and, and how you can deal with that um, when you want people to seem natural, but they might be. Uh, yeah, I mean that the, he wasn't surprised. I mean we had to book that taxi, so okay. that was sort of wasn't. But it does happen. You get into a car with a complete stranger. Uh, generally, they go with it. I mean, my experience with most things is that they will just go with it, and, unless they're. I mean, funny enough, it's Britain is the hardest place to film actually. I think in the world because they are so much they know their rights more and they're worried about where the footage is being used and everything else and that, that they, they tend to stop you whereas in the rest of the world they just get on with it actually that's my experience and it's not a problem and I, I and, and if we enter into a situation I think I remember one of the funniest ones I did was following a um, somebody up a set of stairs spiral staircase around this big house where we knew there was an artist working and we just went in. He knew, we, he, he'd arranged to meet us at a certain time, we went in at that time. The door was open, he said the door's open, come in. We went upstairs and we, was, we walked into this huge studio, this painter guy, painting this uh, uh, full length uh, portrait of a woman who was completely naked. But she didn't know we were coming. <laughs> and we walked in and she just looked and like just carried on <laughs> and I thought if anyone's going to cover themselves up somebody like that would but she didn't she just carried on and didn't worry about it and we just carried on filming so I think you can and uh, you know if people don't want to be filmed they will generally stop you and of course once you've got what you need certainly getting in then you can just stop and say oh by the way we're doing this and is that okay you know, so it's not really good. You were shooting, there were some scenes in that that were slow motion. Were you yeah. shooting at a higher frame rate all the time, or were the specific bits where you'd stop and I mean, they weren't just slowed down, were they? They seemed quite smooth for. No, we did, we did some, we, we did, did some uh, takes were all sh were shot at um, high speed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not high speed, I mean 50, 50 frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, they, were, they were thought through. Right. Uh, they weren't slowed down <coughs> in post. No. And that was shot on film as well? Yeah, 16, yeah. Have you had that agonising switch over? Me, personally? Yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I miss film so much. It's such a beautiful medium to use. Uh, I, occasionally, I still use it occasionally. Whenever I do, it's like coming home. It is just such a beautiful tool to use, a film camera. And, and um, I wish we were still using it, but things have moved on. So um, there's lots of good things about the new technology. What would you shoot now to try and get as close as you could to that? I mean, something like that. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, I, 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 I've sold all my camera equipment because I try and use the right camera for the right job. Uh, something like that, I, I, would pro I might even go like an Alexa 
you know, big proper heavyweight camera because there isn't much handheld. There's a lot of setup stuff, and you're definitely going for those images. Um, whereas something like the peasants, if I was shooting that now, I'd probably go for something like a you know a Sony 900 or 750 or something like that, an HD camera which is still a big camera. I, I, I struggle very much with these small cameras, I must say. I think they're extremely difficult to use and, and to get um, smooth footage. Um, not to mention all the plug-ins and wire-ons that we have to do to make the whole thing work. Um, it's got a question about, either, yeah. I mean, it's very obviously kind of an expressionist kind of documentary where yes. you're you're leading the viewer, you're directing the viewer, and you're shooting, maybe with that in mind, like yes. the scene when she's in the cab, um, almost the, you're making the film cry for her with the That's rain. That's right, yeah. That kind of stuff. Well, I knew the questions that were being asked, yeah. and I knew it was sad that she didn't like the people she was with, but she still did it anyway. Yeah, and she can't show those emotions. Maybe. I mean, and, but it just had to be raining. I mean, that's, yeah. if it wasn't raining, I wouldn't have got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess I, I was going to ask about the previous film. You know, if I'm with a, a subject and I, I, I'm in the bedroom or something, I would say, what would you normally do now? And if they said, I'm, I would normally sit on the bed and read a book, then I'd say, well, do you want to just sure. sit on your bed and read the book? Yeah. I was just wondering whether you've had occasions where you felt yourself go further, where you've said... Can, you know, would you stand at the window and look out the window wistfully? And I mean, how much <laughs> have you have you felt yourself leading towards that kind of control, or do you always pull back? Um, depending on the film, but I quite happily control the situation and suggest things that I want visually, uh, as long as they're happy to do it. I mean, standing at a window is fairly harmless, but. Um, you know, doing an interview with someone in the bath is, is, is a bigger ask, isn't it? But I've done that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not too worried about it, as long as they're happy with it. Yeah. So. To what extent would you actually let them make creative suggestions to you as well, then? I know you're saying naturally they make this. Yes, I mean, if they, if they come up with a... They generally don't come up with visual ideas, but they might come up with an idea that you think, well, that, that's great, yeah, well, let's do that. You know, you might be sitting in your bedroom with a book thinking, what on earth are we going to do? And they might say, well, we could go down to such and such and, you know, do something else. And, and if it's a good idea, then yeah, of course. I mean, the, the trickier thing is when someone wants to have more control, but their ideas aren't very good. So you need to sort of make them feel that it's a really good idea, but actually we can do something different. But you never sort of actively sought that relationship with people? No. No, I mean, generally, you kind of know where you're going. Yeah. Um, I know it's obviously really a totally collaborative process, but where do you find the kind of director's job ends and yours comes in and takes over? Is it, a, is it such a grey area that it's really hard to define? Well, of course, it depends on the director. Joanna, who I worked with on the Geisha film, is, is a very strong director. She has very clear ideas about what she wants. But when you're actually shooting, uh, especially actuality, there isn't much a director can do. Um, I mean, it was interesting with Angus on... The Peasants was the first big thing I did with Angus. I didn't, I'd, I'd done one, one day with him before, it, which I won't go into, but uh, I had been strapped on the top of a truck for three hours going the north and south circular or through the night. Um, but the, when, we got, when we got to the village, I hadn't worked with him before, and when we started filming, what I found interesting was that he kept saying things to me in my ear. He would come up to me, and he'd say, he'd mention a character, or he'd say something completely irrelevant to what I was filming. And, and initially, I would sort of stop and look around and wonder what he was talking about. And uh, I would be sort of, and basically he kept mucking it up. And, and, and so I learned that what was happening was his head was just coming up with ideas all the time, and he was thinking aloud. And he, he'd be looking at what I was filming and think, wouldn't that be great with such and such? And he'd say somebody's name that wasn't even there. And I thought they'd just turned up or something. <laughs> so what I learned to do was ignore everything he said during the actual filming process. <laughs> but of course, in the evening, you know, we'd sit down and we'd just talk through everything. Uh, and of course, during the day when we weren't filming, and constantly going through things. And so I understood where, what he was thinking.
But when it came to actually filming, generally he would just leave me to it, actually. And, and certainly later on, some of the films we did later on together, there, there would be days he wouldn't even be there. You know, he, he might be doing something else, setting up something else, and he'd just leave me to film, because he knew, we knew what we wanted, and the actual process of filmmaking uh, on location, at the end of the day, is not that complicated. It really isn't. You know, once you've sort of built up enough experience to be confident in what you're doing, uh, it, it's not difficult. Uh, uh, and I don't, I've seen other people get into a real tizzy because things aren't going the way they expected, but you've got to go with it. And, you, and if things aren't going the way expected, you, you either uh, take control or you change direction. You know, I think before you start making any film, it's really important to have a structure, an idea of what you're doing with that film, and a look. Uh, and you might start with ideas that change, but at least you're starting with something. And, and, I, th and I think if you're brave enough to, to go through with it, then the rewards will pay off when, when, as you've gone through the process. And even though when things didn't go right, you suddenly realise how much stuff did go right that, that, that makes it into the film. So I think it's just got to be brave, really, and, and, and take control. I suppose you just go out with your tripod and the director gives you a shopping list and says then you can just improvise here, whatever you get. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot more vague than that. It's just like, you know, let's go out and see if we can see any, um, anybody on the street. And you tend to find the busy areas, the junctions and things where people walk around, and you just, you hang out. And I think it's really important with all these things is, uh, I think it's really important to have time to get shots to build up the film. The worst thing is where you're running around all day filming conversations between people that are kind of might be interesting, might not be interesting, but you don't have any time to actually build up a, a sort of visual library, if you like. Uh, and that's what's really what a lot of these films are. you'll notice there are always shots that are, that, that can be sort of put in during the edit that will say a lot more than just watching someone's face. Really. So, so filming on the streets, it's really a case of just being very patient. And f for me, it's fine as you're watching, you're listening, and you're always looking around, waiting for something to happen. But for other people, it's really boring, because they're just standing there waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> I mean, for the director, it's very, very boring. Mm -hmm. Sound recorders normally uses interest as well. What cameramen or directors of films inspired you when you were starting out and you were trying to find your style or your approach to filmmaking? Were there any particular films? Or um, cameramen, uh, well, Walter Lasley, I was liked. Um, uh, and those early sort of, um, you know, French cinema cameramen, I really liked. Because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the early well, French movies generally, they have that, they're quite realistic, aren't mm -hmm. they? They're very natural looking. So that, that would inspire me. And then I suppose people like Cartier Bresson, I always loved that, capturing the moment. Um, and then, of course, the, the, the movies, you know, the great sort of movie directors of when I was young, I don't know, people like Ridley Scott and Francis Ford Coppola and all those sort of movies. <coughs> uh, and, and a lot of, uh, yeah, I, I still watch a lot of French cinema, actually, because it always felt real. Yeah. Oh, technical question, but Ryan Tomlinson and Tomlinson. Sounds like one of my favourite kind of questions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this whole DSR-led, very wide aperture sort of look that people are going yeah, for Yeah, the now. big chip, yeah. What do you think? Uh, I think it's overrated, personally. Um, I, I think if you want to get that look, that cinematic look, then uh, you, can, you can shoot it without a big chip. I mean, I, I think the depth of field thing is just, it's just as fashion, I think, really. And it makes it very, very difficult to shoot in. Uh, we're, we're, I'm talking about documentaries, not, not drama or anything like that. Or, or, I mean, I've, you know, uh, commercials and all that, they have their place. Uh, uh, but certainly documentary, I think it's much more important to uh, actually capture what's going on and have a, have a device, a, a camera, that you can use uh, comfortably. Uh, I mean, certainly with a lot of the DSLRs, when I use them, I'm all shooting on primes. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, and, and there are now short 
zooms that you can use. Some of the ingenue zooms and other manufacturers are bringing them out, and, and they're nice, but they don't have a very long range, uh, which is okay. I mean, if you're up close and you, you don't need that long lens thing, that's fine. But I, I like to use all lenses from very wide to very tight, depending on what I want to try and achieve. I mean, you think that looks so fast that directors are going to start to turn against because it, it seems like briefly it's everywhere. I don't know. I have no I idea. Just, you know, I mean, what I find interesting is it's sort of become acceptable uh, that look of things constantly going in and out of focus. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I mean, I've, I've done it. I've done it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of pride myself because I can generally keep things on, in focus. Uh, but it's very, very difficult on those mm -hmm. lenses, especially if you want to. So I don't, I don't know where it's going to go, to be honest. I mean, what I'd like to see is, I was just talking to Molly about it actually, because uh, she's struggling with it as well, is these small cameras. So I presume, I mean, you guys are probably all using these, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Little cameras? I mean, you're, you're, what are you, you shooting on DSLRs? And no, 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 I'm, I'm, I do use, I'm shooting on Sony 500s, but I'm just about to buy a C300 for the office, but. Yeah. Which is, I, yeah. try, I prefer to have a shoulder mounted camera. I mean, well. I, I, all those DSLRs and C300s and C500s, that, that I will, when I'm using them, I always put them on a proper shoulder rig with weighted back, you know, with all the transmitters, the radio transmitters and everything attached to the rig. I always have a proper map box. I will have a fo follow focus unit so that you're not on the lens, mm. so you've actually got a, a bit of movement there. So what I build up a, 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 a rig mm. to, to hold this little camera, yeah, and, and it's great. And it's great. Your battery runs out. You have to take the whole thing apart to put a new battery in. Um, but uh, what I'd love to see, I was amazed it hasn't happened. I mean, it's sort of beginning to feel it's going that way. Is 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 someone to take the innards out of a DSLR and put them in a bigger box mm -hmm. that sits on your shoulder, which is so <laughs> so simple. It's something ergonomic. Where, you, where it's nicely weighted and the, everything works. You've got the batteries you can just take in and out. You've got sound uh, inputs that work and, and just make it all sit in a little box that you just put a lens on and you just switch it on, you know. So I don't know why it's not happening. I just say as a photographer who's becoming a cinematographer, I find it ideal, so, because I'm very comfortable with it. Right. So. But what sort of things are you filming? Well, I'm just doing the second camera really to what Emma's filming. But you, the, the rig you're talking about, is that on the shoulder or is it just a handheld rig? It's, it's on the shoulder. It's on the shoulder. It's got a, mm -hmm. it's got a weight on the back as yeah, well. Once, once you've got it on the shoulder, it's, it's become a proper camera. Yeah. But, but I think it's you have to build the whole thing up all the time. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You find, though, that uh, you're able to get into smaller places with DSLRs, though, in uh, more confined, intimate uh, mm. settings. But the reality is a lot of you guys are carrying your own kit, you know, you don't have a van with a driver and you don't have an assistant who's carrying a tripod and all that stuff. So of course it's gone all, gone all lightweight, which is great, but I think it's really important to uh, make the effort to, for example, carry, a really basic one is carry a tripod around. It's a good tripod. I mean, the trouble with the lightweight tripods is they're no good. You can't do moves on them. They're very difficult to do smooth moves, especially on long lenses. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's tricky, it's very difficult actually to, to be shooting your own stuff like that. Right, um, I'm going to show you some adverts that I shot, which will just give me some thinking time, but they're very short. Um, just to show the kind of work that I do now. Actually, I'm going to show you one, a really old one, <laughs> that was really interesting. It was an advert for Volkswagen that was shot again on the Super 16, but it was. It was a big budget, it was a massive budget. I mean, it was, we had a truck full of lights and everything else. It was shot in uh, Czech Republic in Prague, and all the scenes are lit. But they're all lit deliberately to look slightly shoddy. They're, the whole thing was made to look like dodgy old documentary. And to the extent where the director was telling me one thing and telling the actor something completely different. So he'd say he was going to walk up there, but actually he didn't. He'd walk the completely the opposite direction, so that it would make me find him and and reframe. It. I was constantly being wrong-footed by the director, deliberately, to get those spontaneous <laughs> moments. Uh, some of it's ha handheld, it's commonly handheld, and some tripod, and uh, they're just little snippets of this this chap, this character we follow, um, and it's and it did very well. It won a gold at the Cannes advertising, whatever it is. But it's quite interesting because it actually looks deliberately shoddy and dodgy 
so that's I'll show you that, and then and then we'll sh I'll show you um, some more recent ones, where it's I find it interesting that what people perceive as documentary and that look of documentary, and how we turned it into uh, commercials effectively. First, the first one is an ASDA one with Ian Wright, the footballer. That was shot, two cameras. Uh, Mark Wolf is the other cameraman. We both had radio um, links, so we could speak to each other. So he would say, "I'm on a, I'm on a mid shot," and then I, okay, I go on a tight shot. And we'd be talking all the time, like, "I can't see them, I can't see them." Okay, I've got it, I've got it. They'd move, so we we're always talking to each other while we were filming, which sometimes did get entertaining, and 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 that's how that one was shot. And then we did the same thing on the Nat West ad, which you'll see. And again, they're all real people. Uh, well, Ian Wright's obviously a known person, but. Uh, the NatWest was all real bankers, with real customers, and we didn't have much time to win their confidence, but they were all brought in with, and they had their own stories, and we'd sit them down, and, and it was all lit. Like, for example, the supermarket, we changed all the overhead lights, so there might be like a hundred light bulbs, you know, it was fluorescence we changed, we had helium balloon, uh, you know, the helium lights up, it was a big lighting setup, but it all looks natural, so it's looked natural. And same with NatWest, the whole bank would do a pre-light day and lit it all so that all the key areas would be bright enough. So, um, so you can look at one uh, sort of dodgy ad and then sort of slightly slicker versions, uh, which were, so we'll kick off with um, one. Uh, no, sorry, not one, 14, 14. Okay, so I'm going to be completely anders. If that's not nice, tell me. Okay. Is that good? Give me them spoons, you're not taking them. You want to try some smoke cod? Let your missus try. Let yours have some. <laughs> I'm hungry. And I'm not going to let you go until you taste the salmon. It's been cooked in the bag. This is the way forward, this is the new way. What's happening? Haddock exactly. written all over him. Yeah, that is what about nice. that? Nice. Is that good? I love your belly. Yum, yum. <laughs> this is lovely. Eat more fish, mm. especially out the bag. Beautiful. Good morning guys, campaign launches today. It's on savings. You really need to help our customers. We're all very disappointed about the falling interest rates. We sort of semi-retired a year ago. Right. So, so our savings are very important to us. We don't want to put our capital at risk. Absolutely. Yeah? <clears throat> it's either feast or famine, and at the moment it's pretty lean. Well, we see a lot of clients that are asset rich and maybe cash poor. Yeah. We haven't really been savers. Right. What you're saying is one should budget. And using your ISAs to do that. Well, that would help. I'm looking to save for engagement ring. OK, it's a pretty special thing, then. Unless she says no, and then it will go on a sports car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the child's education. You know, we're looking towards maybe university. And that's maybe where we would start to look at five years plus. That could include bonds. So I guess, you are right there? Yes, we've been kicked. Blimey. <laughs> Get the kettle on. <laughs> Whatever you're saving for, we can help. Come and talk to us today. NatWest. Helpful banking. I'm just going to um, finish up with um, uh, the, the last sort of interesting film, uh, a very interesting film I did with uh, with Julian Wearing. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Self Made. Yeah. You've seen it. Hey, okay. Uh, well, it was a very interesting uh, experience because um, Julian had never made a structured film before, and. Uh, so it was quite interesting for her. The experience was very interesting. I mean, and what we did was, well, what she did, she, she advertised for members of the public who wanted to be in a film, to, to star in their own film, a film that meant something to them. And, and what we did is we, we filmed a drama workshop uh, with uh, Sam Rumbelow, who, who 
went through drama exercises to explore the the characters that had, had got through. I think there was about eight or nine of them got through. We ended up making, I think, seven short films, and I think only three or four of them actually made it into the finished film because some of them weren't very good because they 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 couldn't act basically. Uh, so what we did, we spent two weeks in this workshop with members of the public going through what were actually very demanding exercises. A lot of them had issues. Uh, I think I'm going to show you James. Uh, he had uh, anger issues. He also had um, other personal problems uh, which ha were greatly affecting his life. And it seemed to all come from when he was a young man, about when he was bullied. So this is an area we explored, and, he, and, and we worked together with him on, on the end film, which, is, is, which you'll see in the clip. Uh, but but you, what you'll also see is the exercises. There was, there was a lot of um, workshop with everybody together, and you'll see where that, some, some of that developed. And then, and then, the, oh, and there's another. There's an exercise with with James and another one of the characters, which is set in a uh, underground uh, train. And again, everything's ad libbed. Not nothing was scripted. It's all made up. It just, uh, they just went with the flow of how they felt. And, and it was interesting with the tube scene because it caught me out. Well, it didn't catch me. Well, it nearly caught me out because it was very, very fast. Uh, and we had. Uh, the character who was playing against him, just to explain what, what you're going to see, because you might find it confusing, is there was, there was a word which James would say if he felt angry and he felt that other person was in danger. Because the, the important thing for us was to, for that person to release everything they had with no inhibitions. So he, anyway, he very quickly said this word, and we were, the, the, the chap that he was talking to walks out, and he's replaced with a dummy. And, and the scene continues, but it's just a cut. You don't see him walk out. Uh, and, then, and then you go into the film that he made at the end. Uh, so we'll, we'll just look at that. This is, uh, and shot, by the way, it's shot on a red uh, with the wide open. All the workshop material was shot uh, wide open. All handheld, very long takes. It was an absolute killer. I had a, a, an easy rig on. Uh, on my hips with a thing that came over to support the weight of the camera. We're doing some of the takes up to 50 minutes. So uh, I remember on day three, I was in so much physical pain, I actually felt sick because it was so tough. But because of what was happening in front of the camera was so good, um, I just kept going. And that was, I mean, it got easier after that, funnily enough. Uh, Okay, so let's just watch um, Self Made James, which is 18. You've never seen evil so singularly personified as in the face of the man that killed you. One's for the day, one's for the little boy. That looks on Tempest was never shaken. Give warning to the world that I have fled. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. When in disgrace with fortune and men's yes, eyes. Sir, yes, sir. I all Three bags full. One for the master. If you read this, I'm. Hallowed be thine. Let me not. not the the marriage of two minds. Thy will be done on earth Love as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Take an action. Improvise. <laughs> you tell the angels in heaven You've never seen evil so singularly personified as in the face of the man that killed you. Good, so you have a sense that you're speaking with your hips and your thighs and your feet. You tell the angels in heaven you've never seen evil so singularly personified as in the face of the man that killed you. You're speaking it from your chest and your stomach and all of those things. You're working well, both of you are improvising. No longer mourn for me when I am dead. 
and hear the surly, sullen bell. Give warning to the world that I am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell. How was that? Good. I wanted to charm him, bring him in, and then I really did want to sort of kill him. Um, but then it sort of almost came like a, became like a power struggle to be noticed, uh, sort of thing. I felt myself with, like, this, he was, like, trying to, as if it was a gun. I felt myself just pushing towards it and thinking, you know, fucking do it. End the suffering, finish it off. When I was in um, there was a lad in a younger year than me. Um, I can't remember his name offhand, but he had two brothers. One was in my year and one was in the year above, and I believe one had just left the high school. So I was in year eight and this guy was in year seven. Now, he started picking on me from the day he went to the school because he knew he could get away with it. Five years later, I was on a tube, and I was at Acton Town train station. Where's your brothers, mate? Mate, where's your brothers? My, my brothers? Your brothers. Your three older brothers that you normally have for fucking protection. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. chance to talk to him. Take, take the chance not just to, what would you want to speak out? What do you want to speak out? I actually don't want to speak to him. Right. I don't want to give him the fucking time of day. Right. He's done all the talking in the past. I don't think there's anything for him to say, and that's what I want to fucking say to him. That's it. That's my fucking revenge, you prick. How are you doing? I feel a bit better. Like, I feel like I've released a lot, but I still want to go back and finish the job off. What, just to keep laying in? It's just yeah. not... So, you, it, do you feel it's insufficient? Like, it's almost like there's not enough you could do, physically? Yeah. If I hadn't left when I did, I think I'd have regretted the final outcome. OK. I think so. Super Mario. Super Mario. Go on, go on, Mario. Hey! 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 Taking a fucking piss now. Which dickhead threw something at my fucking window? Me? Are we doing all that fucking way over there? And you think you're fucking funny? Uh, you a fucking idiot it. or what? Throw something at the window and then fuck off, do you? Uh, it's our funny game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like fucking yeah, pin dick, yeah. eh? Hey? Are you fist? You retired, get away. Talk get away. about the fucking sisters. No, fuck, fuck all about me. Fuck, I want to talk fuck about off. Fuck you. Hey, fucking get your face in my face, cunt. Fuck off. Fucking fuck child, mate. Any pushes. Fuck off. Final fucking warning. Fuck off. Reet. Oh. Fucking one, stop it! You seriously fucking want to? Fucking come on! Fucking come on! Fucking want to? Fucking come on! 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 Fucking come on!
what was interesting for me of working on that was how we spent years and years working with real people in real situations. I was taking real people into kind of artificial situation and just exploring their emotions, engagement with their emotions, which is what it was. It was raw. The whole thing was like this. It was relentless. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very difficult choosing something to show because they're all so powerful. They'd all lay themselves very open. Very open. And uh, it was, it, of course, you are worried about it. And, and, and I was, and some of them came to the, the, the earlier screenings when it was first shown in the cinemas. And um, they were all 100% um, proud of what was on the screen. None of them felt that they'd been exploited or taken advantage of. And, and uh, they all uh, felt they gained something from the whole experience. So that was great. In terms of how you worked with Gillian, was it a collaborative thing where you just simply followed what was happening? Yeah, it's interesting because I mean I had this huge thing on my show. It was a massive rig, and I ended up shooting. It was a decision I made. Very, I made that decision very early, early on. Just shoot it on one lens, on a prime lens. What I, what I felt was it was really nice when I was close to somebody to be physically close to them. So when when you're when you're on a close up, this big. Um, the camera is here, it's that close. And sometimes I was kneeling at their feet, sometimes kneeling between their legs to get the, the close shot that I wanted. And uh, never did any of them seem to be affected by it. It was really interesting. I think through the whole film, you'll see one glance to camera. There's one, uh, Leslie at one point, in another character, she just glances up. She just said something very intimate and very uh, open. And she just looks once. That's the only time that happens in the whole two weeks. And the rest of the time, as you can see in that initial exercise, I was just floating around the room and just concentrating on what people were doing. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to just concentrate on details. I love details, people's bodies, hands, the way they move, um, you know, seeing hair follicles on the back of the neck, you know, seeing a tattoo or a scar or jewelry, and you're know, exploring that person visually rather than just always just listening to what they're sort of saying. It was a wonderful uh, experience for me. How did you work with Gillian? Did well, the actual relationship with Gillian, it was, it was quite spare, I mean, to be honest. Uh, the actual, the two weeks in, the, in the, the studio, the workshop, there was very little conversation, actually. Uh, once we'd established the look, Sam was leading the classes, and he just got on with it. And I just got on with it. And we had a, a radio link, so she could talk, uh, Gillian could talk to me. I think she said like two words in the whole two weeks. Was, well. There wasn't really much going on there, but she was doing a lot more work behind the scenes and getting people in the right state of mind. Uh, so when they came in, they were they they would <coughs> they, they were ready to perform those exercises to the best of their abilities mm -hmm. you know, feel confident in themselves, uh, you know, not to worry about anything. So, trust. so she, so Julian spent a lot of time in the changing. We had a changing room area where they all congregated. They had breaks. They'd go there, sit and have a cup of tea, all chat. And we kept them. We always kept them, the, the, the characters, the, the the people in the film, separate. We never mixed. And and it was a decision we made early on, is because extraordinary things were happening right in front of my eyes. But I would n never chat to them about it. I'd never say. It's amazing what you were saying earlier, because because I, we didn't want to disturb the flow. Mm -hmm. So so it was quite interesting that the way it was done. I mean, the films were just shot as little mini short films; they were fairly straightforward. Uh, but yeah, the the, the 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 relationship in the workshop was very much just following things as they happened. And about the shallow depth of film, it does give you an added level of, of expressionism because you can direct the viewer to look at things. Another clip where, where um, there's a conversation between two people because they're at different distances from the camera. I was, I was playing with the focus so even when someone wasn't saying something I was looking at their expression mm. and then coming back to what they were saying and then that conversation might lead to something in the background but I wanted to hold with them to, to sort of feel what they just said through what you, know, what you were seeing. Mm. So yeah it was interesting playing with that. OK, well, I think we're going to stop. It's also interesting that uh, Julianne could trust you to simply film. Well, I think she was seeing stuff and, and realised that it was working. So yeah. Fantastic. It, it was working Thank you very much indeed.